1.5 ชุนดาสุตตาชุนดาอาสบุดา I ask the sage Buddha of great wisdom, Lord of Dhamma, who is free from craving, the noblest of men, the noblest of guides. How many kinds of monks are there in the world? Please tell me. And the Buddha said, Chunda, there are four kinds of monks, not a fifth. I shall elucidate them to you, since you ask me. One, one kind has won the path. One expounds the path. One lives on the path, and one defiles the path. And Chunda asks, Whom does the Buddha describe as one who has won the path? How does the one who expounds the path become incomparable? Tell me about the one who lives on the path. And then explain to me the one who defiles the path. And the Buddha said, "One who has, one who overcomes uncertainty, is freed from sorrow, delights in nibbana, is detached, a guide of men and gods. Such a person is said by the Buddhas to be one who has won the path. Here, one knows nibbana as the noblest state and expounds and explains the Dhamma. That sage who destroys uncertainty is desireless." This second of monks is called the one who expounds the path. One who has controlled himself mindfully lives well on the path according to the words of the Dhamma well expounded. One who practices correct principles. This third of monks is called the one who lives on the path. That means an Arya. One who disguises himself by wearing the robes of the well-conducted ones, travels for gain, disgraces families, is impudent. Deceitful, unrestrained, a gossip and waffler, pretending to be a real monk, he is one who defiles the path. Having comprehended these four, he who is well versed, householder, who is a noble, wise disciple, and who has understood that all of them are not alike, seeing thus, he does not diminish his confidence or faith. How could the defiled one and the undefiled one, the pure and the impure? Be considered as equals. So here there are four types of monk: one who is liberated, one who the second one is who is liberated and teaches the Dhamma. The third one is one on the path, most likely an Arya. And the fourth one is one who disgraces the path, a false monk. The next sutta is very interesting. One point six Parabhava Sutta. This sutta is not found elsewhere. It's about uh, How a person has a downfall. Thus have I heard. Once the Buddha was living near Savati in the Jeta Grove at Anatha Pindika's monastery. Then one beautiful night, a certain Devata, having illuminated the whole Jeta Grove with surpassing splendor, came to the Buddha and, making salutations, stood on one side and uttered these words: "I wish to ask you, Gotama, about a person who suffers downfall." I have approached you in order to inquire as to the causes of downfall, and the Buddha said, "Easily known is the progressive one; easily known the one who declines. He who loves Dhamma progresses; he who hates it declines or has a downfall. One who loves the company of the evil finds no delight with the virtuous. He prefers the doctrine of the evil. This is a cause for one's downfall. Being fond of sleep." Talkative, lethargic, lazy, and irritable. This is a cause of one's downfall. He who, being sufficiently affluent, does not support his father and mother, who are old and infirm. This is a cause of one's downfall. He who deceives by falsehood, a Brahmin, recluse, or any other ascetic. This is the cause of one's downfall. Here, this priest and monk actually is.、Uh, Brahmana and, and Samana, the two classes of、uh, recluses or ascetics、eh? during the Buddha's time. Those who come from the Brahmin caste、eh? are called Brahmana. Those who come from the other caste、eh? are called Samana.、Eh? Having ample wealth, assets, and property, enjoying them alone, this is the cause of one's downfall. If a man is conceited through his birth. Wealth or community, and looks down on his own kith and kin. That means relations.、Uh, this is a cause of one's downfall. To be a womanizer, a drunkard, a gambler, and to squander all one earns. This is a cause of one's downfall. Not to be contented with one's wife, but to be seen with a prostitute or the wives of others. This is a cause of one's downfall. 
being past one's youth to take a young wife and to be unable to sleep for jealousy of her. This is the cause of one's downfall. This is what Hokkien is called Lao Hiao. Old already, eh? take a young wife and always thinking the wife may be talking to another man, cannot sleep. To place in authority a woman given to drink and squandering or a man of like behavior, this is a cause of one's downfall. This one, eh? that means you appoint eh? a manager to take care of your business eh? and this manager eh? does not have sila, a person who looks after your property or whatever, eh? if he does not have sila, uh, he will squander away all the property. If a member of an influential family with vast ambition and of slender means seeks power or control over others, this is a cause of one's downfall. This one refers to somebody eh, over ambitious, eh, over stretching yourself. Eh. You don't know eh, your uh, blessings eh, are limited. Eh. So, just like some people when they do business, eh, when their business is small, they are very successful, and their business becomes very big, eh, suddenly they collapse. Eh. They don't have the blessings, eh, enough blessings. Reflecting thoroughly on those causes of downfall in the world, the wise one endowed with insight enjoys bliss in a happy state uh, at the end of the sutta. So this sutta is quite uh, interesting. So many causes, uh, uh, pers- so many reasons, uh, so many ways uh, a person can have a downfall. The first one uh, is uh, very important, uh, one who does not appreciate the Dhamma, uh, so he lives his, his life not in accordance with Dhamma. So he will have a downfall, not only in this lifetime, even in future lifetimes. But if we live, if we appreciate the Dhamma and we live according to Dhamma, then we will always progress. This type of suttas is good to copy it and read it again and again. 1.7, Vasala Sutta, about the outcast. Thus have I heard, once the Buddha was living near Savati in the Jeta Grove at Anatha Pindika's monastery, then in the forenoon or morning, having roped himself and taking his bowl, he entered Savati for arms. At that time, in the house of the Brahmin, Agi Ka Bharadvaja, or Agi Bharadvaja, the fire worshipper, a fire was lit and the objects for sacrifice were made ready. Then the Buddha, going from house to house, came to that Brahmin's abode. Seeing the Buddha approaching, he shouted, Stop there, shaveling! Stop there, ascetic. Stop there, outcast. And the Buddha calmly replied, O Brahmin, can you recognize an outcast or know those things that constitute an outcast? And he said, No, indeed, Master Gotama. I cannot recognize an outcast or know those things that constitute an outcast. It would be profitable, therefore, Master Gotama, if you were to enlighten me on this matter. Stop here for a moment. So this person is quite straightforward also. Uh, he admits uh, that he doesn't know what is an outcast. Uh. The Buddha continued, Very well, Brahmin, listen and bear well in your mind what follows. Whoever is angry, harbors ill will, is evil-minded and envious, whose views are delusive, who is deceitful, he is to be known as an outcast. Whoever destroys life or takes life, uh, whether bird or animal, insect or fish, has no compassion for life. He is to be known as an outcast. Whoever is destructive or aggressive in town and country and is a known vandal or thug, he is to be known as an outcast. Whoever steals what is considered to belong to others, whether it be situated in villages or the forest, he is to be known as an outcast. Whoever, having contracted debts, defaults when asked to pay, and retorts, I am not indebted to you. He is to be known as an outcast. Whoever kills a man going along the road, desirous of stealing even a trifle and takes such a trifle thing, he is to be known as an outcast. Whoever commits perjury either for his own benefit, for that of others or for the sake of profit, he is to be known as an outcast. Whoever has illicit affairs with the wives of his relatives or friends, 
either by force or through mutual consent, he is to be known as an outcast. Whoever does not support his father or mother, who are old and infirm, being himself in a prosperous position, he is to be known as an outcast. Whoever strikes or abuses by words, either father, mother, brother, sister or mother-in-law, he is to be known as an outcast. Whoever being asked for good advice, teaches what is misleading or speaks in obscure terms, he is to be known as an outcast. Whoever having committed an offense, wishes to conceal it from others and is a hypocrite, he is to be known as an outcast. Whoever having gone to another's house and taken advantage of the hospitality there, does not reciprocate in like manner, he is to be known as an outcast. Whoever deceives a Brahmin or a recluse or any other ascetic, he is to be known as an outcast. Whoever abuses with words and does not serve a Brahmin or a recluse coming for a meal, he is to be known as an outcast. Whoever, being enmeshed in ignorance, makes untrue predictions for paltry gain, he is to be known as an outcast. Whoever exalts himself and despises others, smug in his self-conceit, he is to be known as an outcast. Whoever is a provoker of quarrels or is avaricious, has malicious desires, is envious, shameless, and has no qualms in committing evil, he is to be known as an outcast. Whoever insults the Buddha or his disciples, whether renounce once or layman, he is to be known as an outcast. Whoever not being an arhan pretends to be one, he is indeed the greatest rogue in the whole world, the lowest outcast of all. Thus have I exposed those who are outcasts. One does not become an outcast by birth. One does not become a brahmana by birth, a holy man. It is by deed that one becomes an outcast. It is by deed that one becomes a brahmana. Stop here for a moment. So you see the 20, the lowest outcast, the lowest type of person is one who is not a holy man. He pretends to be a holy man. Uh, such people, uh, they are heading for uh, hell. Uh, uh, that's why there's a Thai saying uh, that if you go to hell, there's a lot of people in yellow robes. Uh, so sometimes uh, people uh, try to hint they have psychic power or say they have psychic power. Uh, uh, this is uh, a very low outcast. Uh. Now listen and I will give you an illustration. Once there was the son of an outcast whose name was Matanga of the Sopaka caste. He attained the pinnacle of fame and when he had done so, warriors, Brahmins and many others came to serve him. Having destroyed worldly passions, he entered that noble path and reached the Brahma world. Caste did not prevent him from being born in the heavenly realm. Those Brahmins who are familiar with the Vedas and who are born in a family which recites the Vedas, if they are addicted to evil deeds, they are not only disgraced in this life itself, but in the next they are born in a state of suffering. Caste does not prevent them from disgrace or birth in a painful state. One does not become an outcast by birth. One does not become a Brahmana by birth. It is by deed that one becomes an outcast. It is by deed that one becomes a Brahmana, a holy man. When the Buddha had spoken, the Brahmin Agika Bharadvaja exclaimed, It is amazing, Venerable Gautama. It is wonderful, Venerable Gautama. It is as if one might raise what has been overturned, or reveal what had been hidden, or point out the way to him who has gone astray, or hold out a lamp in the dark, so that those who have eyes may see objects, so likewise has the truth been explained by Venerable Gautama in various ways. Therefore, I take refuge in him, his Dhamma and Sangha. May the Venerable Gautama accept me as a lay follower who henceforth has taken refuge in him for the rest of his life. A lot of Brahmins, uh, they think very highly of the Brahmin caste. Uh, so they always like to come and challenge the Buddha. So the Buddha has to talk like this. Uh. The next sutta is 1.8 Metta Sutta, also found in the Kudakapata, the 
the first book of the Kudaka Nikaya. Uh, the Buddha uh, says, uh, He who is skilled in welfare, who wishes to attain that calm state, should act thus. He should be able, upright, perfectly upright, of noble speech, gentle and humble. This is the chant we always do. La. Karanya mata kusalena yantang santang padang abhisamecha, etc. La. Contented, easily supported, with few duties, of light, livelihood, with senses calmed, discreet, not impudent, not greedily attached to families. <clears throat> he should not pursue the slightest thing for which otherwise men might censure him. May all beings be happy and secure. May their hearts be wholesome. Whatever living beings there be, feeble or strong, tall, stout or medium, short, small or large, Without exception, seen or unseen, those dwelling far or near, those who are born or those who are to be born, may all beings be happy. Let none deceive another, nor despise any person whatsoever in any place. Let him not wish any harm to another, out of anger or ill will. Just as a mother would protect her only child at the risk of her own life, even so, let him cultivate a boundless heart towards all beings. Let his thoughts of boundless love pervade the whole world, above, below, and across, without any obstruction, without any hatred, without any enmity. Whether he stands, walks, sits, or lies down, as long as he is awake, he should develop this mindfulness. This, they say, is the noblest living here, not falling into wrong views, being virtuous, and endowed with insight by discarding attachment to sense desires, never again is he reborn. You see, one thing uh, very good about our Buddha's teaching uh, is that uh, we see all beings uh, as related to us. Uh, the Buddha says uh, it's very difficult uh, to find a being uh, you meet uh, who has not been your father, your mother, your relative before. Uh, uh, and understanding that we go on the cycle of rebirth again and again. Uh, so we understand that uh, this is very uh, very probable. Uh, so we don't discriminate uh, uh, on religion. We don't discriminate on on race and all that. Uh, uh, so uh, we practice loving kindness. Uh, uh, and we have no uh, reason to, to kill people. Uh, uh, so we, the Buddha's uh, teaching, uh, if we practice the Buddha's teaching, uh, we never go to war. Uh, the Buddha's religion, uh, very peaceful religion in the world. 1.9, Hema Vata Sutta. This is uh, about two yakas. Uh, the yaka Satagiri, Satagira said, Today is the full moon day of the lunar month. The divine night has approached. Let's see Master Gotama, the teacher, perfectly named. So this uh, Satagira, he has a faith in the, the Buddha, whereas his friend Hema Vata does not, not yet. The Yaka Hema Vata said, is the, state, is the steadfast one's mind well directed towards all beings? As he brought his thoughts as regards pleasant and unpleasant things under his control. And Satagira said, the steadfast one's mind is well directed towards all beings. Moreover, he has brought his thoughts as regards pleasant and unpleasant things under his control. That means uh, he is well directed to all beings. Uh, that means he has uh, loving kindness uh, towards all beings. Uh, and uh, as regards pleasant and unpleasant things, uh, he is not greedy uh, for pleasant things. Uh, and uh, averse to unpleasant things. Uh, and Himabhata says, Does he not steal? Is he self-controlled towards living beings? Is he far from being lethargic or lazy? Uh, does he not give up meditation? And Satagira said, He does not steal. His attitude is one of self-control towards living beings. He is far from being lethargic. The enlightened one does not abandon meditation. And Himabhata says, does he not speak falsehood? 
Does he not use harsh words? Does he not say things which cause distress? Does he not indulge in frivolous talk? And Satagira said, He does not speak falsehood, neither does he use harsh words, nor does he say things which cause distress. He speaks only wise and useful things. And Hemavata asked, Is he not attached to worldly pleasures? Is his mind undisturbed? Has he overcome delusion? Has he acquired insight into all things? And Satagira answered, He is not attached to worldly pleasures. His mind is undisturbed. All his delusion has vanished. The enlightened one possesses insight into all things. And Hemavata asked, Is he endowed with knowledge? Is his conduct pure? Has he destroyed all passions? Has he brought to an end the cycle of rebirth? And Satagira says, He is endowed with knowledge. His conduct is pure. He has destroyed all passions. He will not be subject to further rebirth. And Hemavata said, The sage's mind is filled with good speech and action. He possesses right knowledge and conduct. Let's go and see Gotama. The sage Gotama limbed like the antelope, lean, firm, taking little food, not greedy, who meditates in the jungle. Let's go and see him. Having approached him who is like a lion who lives alone, who is indifferent to worldly pleasures, let's ask for an escape from the snare of death. And both of them asked the Buddha. We ask Gotama, the enlightened one, who declares the Dhamma, who expounds the Dhamma, who has realized all truth, who has overcome hatred and fear. And Hemavata asks, Upon what is the world produced? With what is the world intimate? After having clung to what, by what is the world troubled? And the Buddha said, Hemavata, in six is the world produced. With six it is intimate. After having clung to six, by six the world is troubled. This six, I think, refers to the six spaces, the six sense spaces. Because the six sense spaces uh, produces the world in consciousness. And Hemavata asks, What is that attachment by which the world is troubled? Please tell us the means of deliverance. How does the world escape from misery? And the Buddha said, Having destroyed the desire of the five sensual pleasures in the world, and that of mind, the sixth sense, one escapes from misery. This is the salvation of the world. I have told you as it is. This alone, I tell you, thus the world escapes from misery. And Himavata asked, Who is the one who crosses the flood? Who is the one who crosses the sea? Without a footing, and when not supported, who will not sing in the deep ocean and sea? And the Buddha said, One who is always virtuous, wise, well concentrated, reflects within himself, and mindful, he crosses the flood, which is difficult to cross. Abstaining from lustful thoughts, and having broken all fetters, being one in whom desire for existence is extinct, he will not sink into the deep. And Hemavata says, Look at that great sage who possesses deep wisdom, who is subtle in realizing the truth, passionless, not attached to worldly pleasures, free from all fetters, and who walks on the superhuman path. Look at that great sage of perfect name, who is subtle in realizing the truth, who imparts wisdom, who is not attached to worldly pleasures, who is all-knowing, whose wisdom is perfect, who walks on the noble path. A good sight indeed has arisen today, a good daybreak, a beautiful arising, for we have seen the perfectly enlightened one, who has crossed the flood, who is free from passions. These thousand devas assembled here, who possess supernatural power and fame, all take refuge in you. You are our noble teacher. Thus we shall wander from village to village and mountain to mountain, paying our respects to the Enlightened One and to His Dhamma, which is well preached. So these devas, uh, they come and ask questions. When the Buddha answers the questions, uh, they become His disciples. 1.10 Alavaka Sutta This Sutta is also found in Sangyutta Nikaya 10.12 Thus have I heard, once the Buddha was dwelling in the residence of the Yaka, Alavaka, near the town of Alavi. Then Alavaka came to the Buddha and shouted, Get out, recluse! Uh, by the way, 
it seems uh, the Buddha uh, was around that area. Then the wives of this Yaka Alavaka, they came to talk to the Buddha. And then after talking to the Buddha, they invited the Buddha into the city, which was supposed to be like in a huge tree or something like that. So the Buddha went inside. And then when Alavaka came back, he saw all his wives talking to the Buddha. He got jealous. <laughs> then Alavaka came to the Buddha and shouted, Get out, recluse. The Buddha departed, saying, Very well, friend. The Yaka then ordered, Come in, recluse. And saying, Yes, friend, the Buddha entered. For a second time, the Yaka shouted thus to the Buddha, Get out, recluse. The Buddha again departed, saying, Very well, friend. For a second time, the Yaka ordered, Come in, recluse. Saying, Yes, friend, the Buddha again entered. For a third time also, the Yaka shouted, Get out, recluse. And for a third time, the Buddha departed, saying, Very well, friend. However, when Alavaka shouted his orders to the Buddha, yet again the Buddha retorted, I will not obey you, and you can do whatever you like about it. And he said, I shall put a question to you then, recluse, and if you do not answer, I will derange your mind, or make you mad, or tear out your heart, or take you by the feet and throw you to the other side of the river. And the Buddha said, I do not see, friend, in the world of gods, maras, brahmas, or men, anyone who could do to me such as you say. However, friend, proceed with your question. And Alavaka asked, What is the best wealth to a man in this world? What is the good practice that brings happiness? What is the sweetest of all tastes? What manner of living is said to be the noblest kind? And the Buddha said, Confidence or faith eh, is the best wealth to a man in this world. Well-practiced Dhamma brings the most happiness. Truth is the sweetest of all tastes. Living with wisdom is said to be the noblest kind. And Alavaka again asks, How does one cross the flood of recurrent birth? How does one cross the sea of existence? How does one transcend unhappiness? How does one get purified? And the Buddha said, One crosses the flood of samsara by confidence or faith. One crosses the sea of existence by vigilance. One transcends unhappiness by strenuous effort. One purifies oneself by wisdom. Stop here for a moment. One transcends unhappiness by strenuous effort. You know, when a monk first renounces, there will be a lot of thoughts troubling him. The thoughts are always bringing him back to his home. And the Buddha says that to overcome these uh, thoughts that trouble a new monk, uh, he should practice satipatthana. Satipatthana means intense state of recollection. Uh, for example, the first meditation the Buddha taught uh, is uh, chanting the 32 parts of the body. Uh, head, hair, body, hair, nails, teeth, skin, flesh, sinew, bone, bone, marrow, kidney, heart, etc. Uh, so if a monk uh, keeps chanting this, uh, then uh, the mind uh, does not stray. Uh, uh, go back to the home. Uh, so in the same way, uh, when we have unhappiness, uh, unhappiness is due to a lot of thinking, uh, uh, proliferation of thoughts. Uh, these thoughts multiply and disturb us. Uh, so we do all this, uh, keep the mind very occupied. Uh, that's why it says uh, strenuous effort. Uh, all the time uh, you must use effort uh, and then the mind does not disturb you. Uh, and then Alavaka again asks, How does one acquire knowledge? How does one obtain wealth? How does one attain fame? How does one gain friends? How does one not repent passing from this world to the next? And the Buddha says, One acquires knowledge by reposing confidence or trust and listening or faith and listening to the Dhamma of the Arahants for the attainment of Nibbana, being diligent and attentive. One who does what is proper, one who is resolute, one who is industrious, acquires wealth. Once attain, one attains fame by truth. One who gives, gains friends. Uh, if you are always generous, uh, you'll have a lot of friends. The confident householder in whom there are four virtues, truthfulness, goodness, energy and generosity, will not repent after his death. And the Buddha said, I challenge you to consult other ascetics and Brahmins to ascertain whether there can be any other qualities higher than truth, self-control, generosity and patience. 
and Alavaka said, Why should I consult other ascetics and Brahmins? Today I know which one will prove for my good in the future. The Buddha indeed came to my residence near Alavi for my benefit. Today I know what should be given to achieve great results. From today I will wander from village to village, from town to town, paying my respects to the fully enlightened one and to his perfect teaching. Uh, so this fierce Yaka huh, converted and became a protector of the Buddha. 1.11 Vijaya Sutta. It's about uh, reflection on the unattractive uh, nature of the body, the 32 parts of the body. Anyone, if either walking, standing, sitting or lying down, contracts or stretches his body, such is motion of the body. The body is put together with bones and sinews, plastered with skin and flesh, whose real nature is not perceived. It is filled with intestines in the stomach. Uh, uh, it should be intestines in the abdomen. Eh? The lump of the liver in the abdomen, the bladder, heart, lungs, kidneys and spleen, with mucus, saliva, perspiration, limb, blood, the synovial fluid, bile and fat. Then in nine streams, impurity constantly oozes. From the eye, eye excrement. From the ear, ear excrement. From the nose, mucus. Sometimes the body em emits vomit from the mouth and ejects bile and phlegm. From the body flows sweat and dirt. The cavity of the head is filled with the brain. But the fool, because of his ignorance, regards it as a fine thing. When the body lies dead, swollen and livid, cast away in the cemetery, the relatives do not care for it. Dogs, jackals, wolves, worms, crows and vultures and other living beings eat it. In the world, the monk who is wise, listening to the Buddha's word, fully comprehends the body and sees it in its true perspective. He compares his body to a corpse and thinking that this body is the same as a corpse and a corpse is the same as this body. He removes desire for his own body. In the world, such a wise monk who is free from desire and attachment attains the immortal, tranquil and deathless state of Nibbana. The body is impure, bad smelling and replete with various kinds of stench which trickle here and there. If one, possessed of such a body, thinks highly of himself and despises others, that is due to nothing other than his lack of insight. So when we are young, uh, we think we are very beautiful, very handsome. Uh, and we look at old people uh, and we tend to despise uh, old people looking so ugly. But actually very soon uh, we will also grow old uh, and look ugly. And then very soon our body will turn into a corpse. Uh, uh, so we, here the Buddha says, uh, we must compare your body to the corpse uh, and realize uh, your body is the same as the corpse. And the corpse is the same as your body. Uh, in a very short time. Uh, so that will help you uh, to uh, not be so vain about the body. Uh, come to the last sutta of the chapter, 1.12. Muni Sutta. Muni is a sage. Fear arises because of intimacy. Sensual desire is born of the household life. Homelessness and detachment is therefore appreciated by the sage. One who cuts off defilements that have arisen, who would not plant them again, and who would not enter into what is being grown. He is said to be the solitary wandering sage. That great sage has seen the state of peace. Having considered the ground, having discarded the seed, and not supplying moisture for the growth of that seed, having abandoned sophistry, that sage who has seen the end of birth cannot be categorically described. He who has known all kinds of birth but does not desire to enter into any of them, such a sage is freed from greed and desire. He toils not, for he has reached the other shore. One who has overcome all, who knows all, who is intelligent, who does not cling to any object, who has abandoned everything, who has freed himself by destroying desire, is called a sage by the wise. One who possesses the strength of wisdom, born of the moral precepts and restraints, who is tranquil in mind and delights in meditation, who is mindful, freed from attachment, freed from mental barrenness and the asavas, 
is called a sage by the wise. The sage who wanders alone, who is diligent and undisturbed by praise or blame, not frightened by noises like a lion, not caught in a net like the wind, not soiled by water like the lotus, leading others but not led by others, is called a sage by the wise. One who is firm as the post in a bathing place, control over what others say, who is passionless, whose senses are well composed, is called a sage by the wise. One who is firm-minded and straight as a shuttle, who despises evil actions, investigating what is good and bad, is called a sage by the wise. One who is self-restrained and does not commit evil, that wise one, whether young or middle-aged, whose mind is well restrained, who is not provoked and does not provoke others, is called a sage by the wise. The monk who depends on others, who does not praise or blame the giver when he has received alms, either from the top or the middle portion or the remainder, and who neither flatters nor treats with disrespect, is called a sage by the wise. The sage who wanders alone, who has abstained from sexual intimacy, who even in his youth is not attached to anything, who has detached himself from pride and indolence, is called a sage by the wise. One who has known the world, who has perceived the highest truth, who has crossed the flood and sea of existence, who has cut the ties of rebirth, who has no clinging to sense objects, who is free from the asavas, is called a sage by the wise. The sage who is accustomed to living in distant places, the egoless and well-conducted one, and the householder who supports a family, they are not equal. For the householder is unrestrained and destroys life. The sage is well-restrained and protects living beings. The blue-necked peacock which flies through the air never approaches the speed of the swan. Similarly, the householder can never resemble the monk who is endowed with the qualities of a sage, who meditates aloof in the forest. Uh That's the end of the sutta and the chapter. So you see, all these uh, verses are very inspiring, always uh, uh, encouraging uh, a monk uh, to wander alone, to live alone. This lonely life, uh, uh, if you are not used to it, uh, uh, can be a lot of suffering, but when you get used to it, uh, you like to be alone. Anything to discuss? You can see from these suttas uh, why I say uh, the Sutta Nipata is the most important or the best book uh, in the Kudaka Nikaya. And next to this uh, is the Dhammapada. Dhammapada also has a lot of Dhamma inside. Uh, where is that? Page twenty-one, twenty-two. Ah, uh, which uh, fear arises because of intimacy. When you are intimate with uh, uh, people, uh, you fear losing them. Those you love, la. Uh, I didn't hear clearly. Don't put too near the your one. Huh? Uh, have to wait a while. Why can't the Buddha accept the food uh, after uh, saying those words? Uh? The Buddha says uh, he does not chant for his meal. Uh. So, uh, in other words, uh, what a lot of monks are doing uh, uh, is wrong. No? Just like uh, the part we, part we uh, uh, collect money uh, after the chanting. Uh. 
is against the Buddha's teaching. Uh, so people give, huh? uh, uh, because they want to give, lah. Uh, because you see, after the Buddha said those words, huh, and you give, uh, it's like the Buddha begging you to give, lah. So that's why the Buddha said, I throw away that food. Lah. If you want to give, give another portion. Not that food. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Uh, uh, not exactly, because this one, uh, is the way the Buddha said, uh, is that uh, convincing him to give like that. Uh, so uh, that is wrong. Hmm. Or if you do the chanting as a means of uh, livelihood, no. Hmm. Like we do the chanting, uh, uh, transference of merit, no? it is different. No? Hmm. So like the chanting, you transference of merit is after the food is given, no? uh, and, we, and that is also for the departed. No? Uh, Arahanhood uh, is achieved uh, not only by listening to the Dhamma but by having the four jhanas. So uh, those devas who come to listen to the Dhamma generally are those that are nearby la, in the sensual desire realm la, and they don't have the four jhanas. La. So usually after listening to the Dhamma, they attain stream entry. La. They understand and attain stream entry. So from the suttas we find uh, uh, generally there's uh, the highest they attain. Because other higher stage than uh, stream entry you have to meditate. So they have so much, uh, they are so busy with enjoyment uh, and no time to meditate. Uh, that is provided you practice. Lah. If you don't practice, uh, then uh, being a deva is better. <laughs> Yes, uh, if a person has four jhanas, but he must uh, know the Dhamma. La. If he does not know the Dhamma, then uh, the most uh, is he has psychic power, la, like external sex, ascetics. Uh, but even uh, external sex, ascetics, uh, when they have four jhanas, uh, Mara cannot sit still. La. He's afraid they become enlightened, uh, so he come and disturb la. So as long as you have not attained the fourth jhana, don't worry that Mara will come and disturb you. So I hope you all, after listening to this, you can take back the book and look through it again. So you can understand better. And if you have questions tomorrow, also you can ask. Okay, shall we end here?